Hello viewers, and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. There have already been some snowflakes falling in Alberta, so it's time to celebrate with a winter whitewash. Before that snow's no longer something to celebrate. Speaking of celebrating, I was once again hooked up for this video by sunwordhobbies.ca. That means we have a Canadian YouTuber backed up by Canada's largest selection of hobby paints, tools, and plastic kits, and they ship to most parts of the US and Canada. The only thing that would make this video more Canadian is if I chugged a bottle of maple syrup while wearing a Leafs jersey. Sunward was also kind enough to send all the paints required for this build. It's always nice to have a supplier that can give you all the paints you need and you can get everything in one stop. So let's get into the build. As you can see, I'm doing Edward's BF109F, and in my opinion, this is probably one of their best kits they've released. With their F, there's no plugs you need to insert in the nose, there's really no seam cleanup, and it goes together really well with no filler. And all in all, it's a kit you can slam together and have fun with painting. With this being a profi pack, there's also enough detail in the cockpit to keep it interesting, but not enough that you're going to spend a few weeks down in there trying to get everything installed. Within a few hours, you'll have the cockpit painted and ready to be closed up. You might be asking yourself, why are you using a pink primer inside of an aircraft? Well, the reason for that is pretty simple. The fuel line that goes inside of the cockpit ends up being yellow, and yellow goes down and covers pink very well with only two light coats. So rather than clearing the airbrush for another primer, or having to put six or seven coats down on that fuel line, I just use pink primer to make it all easier. In this video, you're also going to see two different styles of chipping that I use. The first one in the cockpit here, I've put down a lacquer silver paint from Mr. Color, and then put on top AK Real Colors Acrylic RLM 66. You might be asking why you would do that. Well, the nice thing about a acrylic paint on top of a lacquer is it's very easy to chip away without the use of any chipping fluids. So what you'll see here in a few minutes is I'll come back with a needle and a toothpick to put some chips where I want them. Now I want some chips. With the base gray down, it was time to start getting into the detail painting in the cockpit. By masking the clear part provided by Edward, you actually get a really nice looking fuel line. Another benefit to using an acrylic paint on top of a lacquer paint like the Vallejo here is you can actually chip away your overpainting quite easily without damaging the paint underneath, giving you a nice clean break. That is also handy when you're painting the rubber connections between the pipe and the clear part of the fuel line, and if you want to get really crazy and paint the clamps as well. I usually don't get too crazy painting the cockpit of the 109 because once you close the fuselage, there is really not much to see. It's pretty tight and it gets pretty dark. So I use some more vibrant colors than usual just to make things pop a little bit. One skill I'm trying to get better at is blending acrylic paints. So when painting the canvas at the bottom of the control stick, I tried using a lighter color and a darker color, but I still really can't get a handle on this and I ended up running it all together with an orange colored wash. That just means I'm going to have to do some more figures down the road to get a better handle on that. Because practice makes perfect. Or it makes you crazy with rage. One of the two. Once again, I was trying to use some acrylic paints to make the leather pad behind the pilot's head pop a bit. And again, I wasn't really that great at making it blend. I still find oils easier to blend with. There's just the problem of setting them up before you can use them. Where in acrylic paint, you can just squirt it out of the bottle and go for it. If you have any tips for blending acrylic paints, Please post in the comments section and let me know how you do it. Maybe I'll finally be able to get that under my belt. The headrest is one of the few things that are actually going to be visible in the cockpit when it's assembled. So I ended up spending a lot more time here than usual. So now it's time to move back into chipping. As we saw earlier, I had a lacquer silver down and then an acrylic gray on top of it with no chipping fluid. So now by using a variety of small tools, I can start chipping away the paint in the raised area of the cockpit that makes sense. I'm not going to put chips on top of the control column or on the dashboard where the pilot's not going to be having his feet impacting, but in areas like the rudder pedals and the foot rests on the floor, those are going to be the most focused on areas, including the seat pan where the parachute buckles would be rubbing as well. The toothpick gives me a lot larger chips than the sewing needle, but it also takes a little bit more effort to get that paint to rise. If you're too hard with this, you can actually end up scratching right through to the primer. Trying to bring this cockpit out of the dark ages means a quick dry brush with some aluminum paint over the metal panels just to make them pop a little bit more. This is more of an artistic technique than a realistic technique. It does a very good job of letting you know that's a metal part you are looking at. 
The new Profi Pack packing of the BF109 gives you a nicer panel with the glass already in place for the dials, so that's just a matter of gluing it together and setting it in place. One last stop in the cockpit is to put a pin wash in place. And to make these panels and colors pop a little bit more, I'm using a darker wash than usual. I've created this wash using a Windsor Newton oil paint and thinned it down with some odorless thinner from AK. And I blend it until it runs freely along panel lines, but not freely enough that it just soaks everything. Right here is what the ideal wash should do. Once the wash has had time to dry, then I come in with a clean brush to wipe up the excess. And this just makes everything look neat and tidy. If I wanted a more weathered effect here, I wouldn't clean up as much as the wash, as that would just help show some staining and dirt accumulation. I have not used any clear coats here to seal in the paint. This wash is directly on top of the acrylic paint. One hack in the cockpit was to go over the gear clamps on the fuel line with a mechanical pencil. This just helps add a little bit of a shine to the metal. My apologies that this is floated to the bottom of the screen, but this is a pretty tiny part. Now, after a total of about 12 hours in the cockpit, it's ready to be closed up and never be seen to the world again. Moving into assembling the gear bays turns out to not be a hassle if you clean everything up and test fit before gluing. If you've taken your time here, cleaned off the gates, you'll be rewarded by that wing top just dropping nicely into place. And with that, a quick test fit of the fuselage has that popping into place as well, to the point where you might not even have to glue this if you wanted to. Taking your time rewards you with a very nice wing root fit here that requires no putty. The only filler I used was just in front of the windscreen there, and then in front of the engine cowling where there's not supposed to be a seam. But that's something you can't avoid. Just like the P39 build, I opted to use super glue again here for the filler. The reason for that is it dries quick and it allows you to sand it off within a short period of time. Whereas sprue glue does tend to shrink a little bit over time. Cleanup was a breeze just using some sanding sponges from using 800 grit all the way up to 1500 grit. Then it was time to put the horizontal stabilizers in place, and again, no fillers needed here either. With major assembly completed, it was now time just to move on to the flaps and shutters for the coolers. And again, the fit here is so nice that it doesn't require any cleanup at all. And you could even paint these separate from the model. The only real challenge to this kit is making sure your angles are all set properly. But anywheres where you do have to set that angle, Edward has provided a diagram in the instructions for you to follow. So flaps, shutters, and landing gear as well. I'm going to say goodbye now to that cockpit detail as the last masks go in place from the Profi Pack. And these didn't require any trimming at all to fit. You could purchase some resin tires for this set, or you could just take the time to clean up the tires and rescribe them with a JLC razor saw. All in all, this cleanup took about half an hour and saved me the $15 it probably would have cost for replacements. As a side note, the injury to the finger there with the blood was not modeling related. Ready to move into paint now, I once again used pink primer in the areas that I would be using yellow. But to save the pink primer, which has been hard to find, I primed the rest of the aircraft with the 1500 gray. One of the biggest challenges with this build was that it's my first time doing a whitewash on an aircraft, and this was applied in the field, meaning it wasn't done in a controlled factory setting. To start things out, I decided to do the factory paint on the model first, and I didn't paint it as dark as it shouldn't have been because I wanted the white to cover a little bit easier. The idea here being that you would be able to see the original paint underneath through the white. To cover up the yellow overspray and to set the pre-shading for the following colors, I used the darker Africa RLM 78 for the bottom of the aircraft. In the end though, this turned out to be a little bit of a waste of time because none of it was visible through the white. For my next German aircraft build, I'm going to have to spend some time with a paint mule seeing which colors can mess with the light blue the best, just like on the olive drab on the P-39. Moving into the darker colors of the paint, like the RLM 75 and 76. Moving now into the darker colors of the livery, like the 75 and 74, 
I'm not looking for full coverage on top of that primer, just enough to leave a hint of those colors for to cover up with the white. If I had it gone to the full darkness, it would have taken three or four coats to fully cover. And once again, I'm using lacquer paints that are going to go underneath acrylic paints just to keep them from getting damaged during the chipping process. Again, I'm not looking for full coverage with this color. One nice thing about this Profi Pack is it gives you the summer and winter markings for the same squadron, so I didn't have to do any research before busting up this Splinter Camouflage. And I'm a very big sucker for the Splinter Camo, so I might have to come back to the German paints again at some point. But lately, it seems like a lot of the German stuff's been building up in my stash, so I might need to use some Allied stuff to change it up. One of my favorite parts of building the model is removing the masks. The only part I like more is when the decals start to go down and then the model really starts to come to life. Now setting the base for chipping, I'm going to apply some AK heavy chipping fluid on top of the paint. There's no clear coat here or anything protecting that paint. And I'm trying to do it in a light enough layer that it mists on. If you start getting beads on the paint, your chipping fluid's gone on too heavy and you're not going to have that controllability when you're chipping it away. If the chipping fluid's on too thick, it'll just pull away in sheets instead of those nice small microchips that you want. To have some fun with the layering in the whitewash, I started out with an insignia white, and that was going to be the darkest the paint would be. And then when I finished my first coat and had about 50% opacity, I then moved into the pure white from Tamiya for the second coat. The difference between the insignia white and the flat white was just enough that it really let me play with the wear and tear in the paint. The problem is I don't want to build things up too thick because that will also mess with the chipping fluid and have things coming off in sheets. For the first step in chipping away the paint, I'm going to apply just some water on top of it. And the idea here is this activates the chipping fluid underneath. The problem is it can take a little bit of work to get this to start chipping. But once it does start to chip, you'll find that it starts to chip faster and you'll actually take less effort to build more chips. The big takeaway here is to take your time doing this and try not to do all of your chipping in one session. It can take a few before you get the chips you want. Don't be afraid to change out that brush for a toothpick or sewing needle or even some 3000 grit sanding sponge just to break up that paint a little bit more and to get a variety of chips. Variety, remember, is the flavor of life. With the toothpick, I ended up getting a lot of chips that I really liked and then moved back to the paintbrush to try to get some more of those microchips. This is a process where you're going to find yourself switching out between tools. One of the big things to remember as well with chipping is that it has to make sense. You're not going to put chipping in an area that wouldn't see handling by the ground crew. For example, the crew is always going to be climbing on the wing route here to service the aircraft and the pilot himself getting aboard. But you're not going to see this type of wear out at the wingtips where the crew wouldn't walk, otherwise they would damage the wing. One of the great things about 3000 grit sanding sponge is it does a great job wearing away the paint in the same way that your shoes would wear away paint. It'll just let a little bit show through, but not completely remove it. At this point, my camera is really struggling with the white, so it's hard to show some of those tiny microchips, but you'll see those in the final photos. With the first round of chipping complete, it was time to move on to the decals. And these new Edward decals went on very well. I used Mr. Mark Softer, and then I used Tamiya Mark Fit Strong afterwards to sink them down. And I really didn't have to remove the carrier film that was barely visible. The only difference was I wanted the markings to be a little more faded, so I actually attempted to peel away the carrier film. And unfortunately, there was one or two spots where this didn't go well. I still find it's easier to remove carrier film from the black inks, but the color inks tend to tear up a little bit. So when next time I do an Edward kit, I'm not going to bother with the peeling method. I skipped that on the Spitfire I built from Edward two years ago, and it seemed to work really well. And here I am doing my best impression of the Pimple Popper Doctor by gently trying to tease this carrier film off. Again, Edward doesn't officially endorse this, and this is just a happy side effect that some modelers have discovered.
Uh, I thought I was going to get that all in one piece. Damn it. Another area on the model that took a little bit of time that I wasn't expecting was painting the spinner hub. Just the way the geometry of this breaks down, it's a little bit of a challenge to mask cleanly and then to paint it afterwards. And in the end, I just came in with some a paintbrush and touched up the little bit of overspray. With the decals in place, it's now time to seal everything with two thin coats of flat clear. And this will let me move on to the brush chipping to finish up those wing roots. This was another exercise in self-control because it's very easy to get out of hand with these brush chips. But the idea here is I'm just trying to tie them together to make this all tell a story. Referencing a few aircraft that are undergoing painting, it tends to chip along rivet lines before it rips off some sheets. So that's what I'm doing here. This might seem vibrant right now, but as soon as I come in with the pin washers, it'll start to push this all back. I'm not really stroking with the brush here for this effect. I'm just letting it tap on the wing to get little dots. Think of it like when you zoom up really close to a printer picture. I can also see why Night Shift would do this for hours, because for some weird reason, I found this really relaxing. Having been fortunate to be in the United Kingdom this past year and see some BF-109s in person that ran, and some Spitfires, I could see that the exhaust stacks were very different on the 109s with how they weathered. So to get that effect, I'm looking for a dark brown with a little bit of purple and then some steel chipping on the exhaust stacks. Once the brush painting was done, I came in with that glaze so I could get that metallic sheen on the exhaust stubs. After that, I came in with some graphite powder from Vallejo and just did a quick dry brush on the exhaust stacks as well. This might seem extreme right now, but again, it's about to get buried at the end of build with some smoke staining, so it won't be as dramatic. One last challenge on the model was trying to find an appropriate color for the pin wash. I have the AK panel liners, and it says the winter white wash right on the lid, which would make it convenient, except I found it was too black and too stark. Now I am working on top of white, so that's already a big challenge. So what I did was created a dark, dark, almost black blue color to use as a filter. The idea being that the blue will actually make the model look colder, being an old artist trick. I find the oil-based washes are a lot easier to work with than the enamel-based one, and cleanup is a breeze. If I have any stubborn oil that doesn't want to come up, I just moisten a shop towel with a little bit of odorless thinner. I don't want it soaking, I just want it slightly moist that will lift up that little bit of excess without actually lifting up everything. Now with the pin washed down, it was time to pull the masking off the cockpit, and hopefully not find any dust that got placed on the inside during painting. I've had this happen a few times in the past, so I found the easiest method was to just not install the canopy until the painting was complete and I could clean it up afterwards. For the final exhaust painting, I brought out my trusty mix of Tamiya Rubber Black and Red Brown. Highly thin, so it's very slow to build up, and this gives you a lot of control over the stain. And then with that complete, it was time to move into the rigging being the last step. And to do this, I used some Easy Line and then used some super glue to lock it in place. Once the wire had some time to dry and was secure, I then added in the bumps on the wire using some super glue as well, and then painted them with a silver paint. That is going to be it for this build. I really appreciate you stopping by and watching. And again, a big thank you to Sunward Hobbies and Daniela for hooking me up with this kit and supplies. Make sure you check them out at sunwardhobbies.ca. You better get over there quick though, because they just got a bunch of Edward kits in, and they seem to be going pretty fast. Tell them Robbie sent you. And as always, make sure you click subscribe and the like button if you enjoyed this video and leave a message in the comments section below. And if you didn't enjoy it, let me know why. And I'm always doing my best to follow up with you guys. I am the Model Guy and I will see you next time.
the new profi pot yeah the new profi pack packing of oh my god the new profi pack packing of the bf 109 gives you a nicer panel with the glass already in place for the dials so that's just a matter of gluing it together and setting it in place